I mean, I you know, I am always totally like so pumped about the music that our first lady picks out. It's just so wonderful. Bless your heart. <laughs> and look, and she gets so tickled about it too. I, I can't even imagine what it's like to be at home with you on the Saturday night. Yeah, it's like she up in there having church already, all by herself or something. Oh, well, Reverend, you know. But isn't that awesome? You know, it's interesting. Um, you know, God has, like, done a true work in each and every one of us, and a lot of times we don't know that. You know, a lot of times we kind of forget about that where we are, we're supposed to be. This is like our divine right space, and it's our divine right thing. So this morning I was kind of reflective about the last year. You know, we, we come off of 2016 on a high, and I don't know if you guys were thinking about where you were this time last year or not, but for me it's like, wow, you know, this has been an awesome year. So, um, so I'm grateful. I'm grateful for that. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all are funny. <laughs> Y'all are funny. Bless your hearts. <laughs> I love it, though. I love it. I love it. I love it. You know, um, I started thinking about, you know, what I wanted to come in here and talk about. And it was interesting because I was thinking to myself, like, you know, usually I'll come in and I'll talk about something that was really pressed upon me in this, you know, over the past week. Because I stay prayerful all week about what I'm supposed to talk about, you know. And it's just one of those things. It's like, okay, to see what comes up. And so, you know, I was thinking to myself, this has not been like one of those weeks that I had a lot of inspiration. But then I thought about what I did just a few, well, I think it was maybe Monday or Tuesday. I don't know if you guys are like me. Um, there are sometimes you hear stuff and you hear it and sometimes you can hear it over and over again. And it doesn't necessarily resonate with you until all of a sudden it does. So I was listening to a program, I think, on NPR, and I heard the person make this comment that Eleanor Roosevelt said that every day you should do something that truly scares you. And I thought about that, and I, I actually wrote it down on a sheet of paper, and I pinned it up on my cork board so that I can remind myself every day to do something that truly frightens me. And I kept thinking about it all week, and I kept thinking every day, checking myself, did I do anything that scares me? And you know, it, it, it's funny because when you do stuff that scares you, you know it's a challenge for you. You know it's something that you normally wouldn't do. And so I started thinking about that this morning. It's like, you know, how many days did I go to sleep thinking to myself, I didn't do anything that really scared me. I stayed in my comfort zone. And so I keep saying every, over and over again every day, it's going to be really big. It's going to be really big, that something that scares me. And really, it's probably not. I mean, for, for most of us, the things that scare us are things that people, other people do every day and don't even think anything about it. I mean, you know they say that public speaking is one of those big fears that people have, one of the three top greatest fears. And, you know, this is something I do every day without thinking about it. It's no big deal to me. But for somebody else, it would be that something that scares them. So when we think about what it is that scares us and why, what is it that scares you? Is it singing in public? Is it asking somebody for a favor? Is it actually going after your dreams? Is it saying hello to somebody or actually instead of, you know, like acting all bashful, is it something else? You know, what is it, what is that thing that truly scares you? So I started thinking about how often we mask the things that really scare us. There's a story I loved in the, well, I'll say I loved it. It's an interesting story in the Bible. You guys will remember it. I, set, I actually set my um, books up here, not because I'm actually going to look at them, but because 
they remind me of what I wanted to talk to you guys about. Um, there is a, uh, this one book uh, called I Come as a Brother, and it talked about us really coming in alignment with the things that are our, our true power. And so I was recounted this story that came out in the Bible. And the story was in John, and it was about the guy who was by the pool in Bethesda. You guys remember that story? It was interesting because um, the way that the story goes is that Jesus had gone into Jerusalem right about the time, um, right before the Sabbath or right on the Sabbath. And when he goes in, he's, there's this pool, and it says that this pool, like, there's, you know, it's like in the center, and it has all these, like, ways that come into it, like five different, like five points that kind of come into where the pool is. And it said as he as they came into the crowd, he came in with his 12 disciples. And as he came in through the crowd, there were all these people that were gathered around the pool because they said that at the pool, if you, you know, the angel will come in and stir up the water. And then the per first person that bathes in the pool, that person will be healed. And so Jesus and his disciples came in, and he's, he's pushing through the crowd because most people apparently didn't, you know, didn't know exactly who he was. He's pushing in through the crowd, and he comes along beside this man who it appeared had been there for a long time. And Jesus had a conversation with this man. And it appears that the man had been laying there by the pool for 38 years. And he said that, he said, you know, the problem is, is that, you know, every time the angel comes to stir up the water, I can't make it over there because I don't have anybody to help me get over there. I don't have anybody to help me into the pool. And so I've laid here for 38 years, um, you know, at, and at some point, maybe he's figuring that he's going to get in the pool. Now, it's interesting because I thought, you know, as I, you know, as we revisit that story, it's, it's an interesting story. I mean, for 38 years, you laid by a pool. You know how long 38 years is? I mean, it was interesting because the way, you know, the, when the Bible kind of, you know, touches on the story, it said, you know, 38 years. And I'm thinking to myself, how could this be? 38 years. I mean, we're here just talking about one year from last Christmas to this Christmas. I mean, 2016. We got kids that are older than 38 years. You know what I'm saying? And so, you know, I'm, I'm sitting there and I'm trying to, like, wrap my mind around how anybody could actually be there for 38 years and not have been able to get to that pool. Like, even if you kind of rolled your way you know, to get there, it seems like that's an awful long time. But now I started thinking about it in terms of maybe the idea of getting into the pool was a different kind of idea, a symbolic type of thing. I started thinking about what water means, and you know, water is, is symbolic of the subconscious, and to go underwater is, is to delve deeply into your subconscious, and there's things that come up. And then I started thinking to myself, like, well, you know, maybe it's because the angel only comes ever so often. And how do we know when it's actually there? How do I, you know, maybe there's all of these factors. But then I started thinking about our fears and the things that we fear to do. And a lot of times we get so stuck in our fears that it does take us a while to first off recognize, wow, this is a fear that I have, and then second off to move beyond that fear into action and to do what it takes. People languish 38 years in marriages that they've never been happy in or on jobs that they would just not wish on their worst enemy. I mean, there are so many things that people have, you know, they fear and they latch on to. And because the fear of not knowing what's on the other side is so, seems so much greater, they get caught in what they fear and they don't move beyond to see what's possible. And so as I started thinking about it in terms of us going from this place into the next place into what's possible, I started thinking to myself, now that sounds more like, you know, that's something that's 
doable. Like now I can understand that. I mean, I've got friends that will tell you that they've been in um, abusive relationships for longer than that. I mean, and fear of, of leaving that particular thing, they just don't have. And we see people who, at one point in their lives, seems like they're really on top of things and they can do things, but because they've been so beaten down by life, they can't figure out how to move beyond their previous limitations. I mean, how many times have we told ourselves that, you know, uh, I'll buy my house when this happens or I'll go back to school when that happens or, you know, we'll actually follow our dreams when something else happens and we get caught and before we know it, all of these years have gone by and we still haven't done the very thing that we wanted to do. I remember my mother used to say that she always wanted to travel. Oh, that was what she wanted to do. And she, you know, it, it's interesting because my mother would have these little talks with me and she would, you know, while we were washing dishes or I'm drying or something like that, she's drying, I'm washing, you know, whatever the case may be. And she would say, you know, Sandy, I always wanted to travel. And she says, and if you want to do that, you know, if you want to do something with your life, do it before you get married. Do it before you have kids, because once you do that, you know, you're caught. <laughs> and so it was always her plan that once she retired, then she would start to travel. How many people do you meet like that, that they make a plan that once something happens, then they'll do what it is that they desire? My, I, I ran into a lady one time, and she's out there watering her grass, and me and my girlfriend are walking past, and she said, if there's something you want to do, you do it now. Mm -hmm. She told me the same story. She said, me and my husband, we saved up, we put all our money away, and we planned to travel once we retired. And she says, and then he went and died on me. <laughs> and she turned the water back on as she was telling us, and she was like, if he wasn't already buried, I'd dig him up and kill him again. <laughs> you know? And she carries that anger with her because there was a plan. She felt like they had a plan. And so sometimes we can get caught up in living life and our plans go by the wayside. We don't do the very thing that it is that we desire to do because of, of all of these things that we put up. If this happens, then that happens. And a lot of times we don't recognize it, but it's our own fear disguised as sound reasoning. You know? I mean, how many times do we think that we're doing what's smart and what's best? And, and really, if we really look at it and identify it, it's really our own fear that's telling us the reasons why we can't do it right now. I know for me, I can, I can sit there and tell you a whole bunch of reasons why not to do something. You know, our friends will sit there and tell us, ah, oh, you can't do this because of such and such and such and such, or nobody's ever done that. It sounds like real reasoning, right? But really it's our fear talking to us and telling us, not right now. And so what happens is, is 38 years later, when we're barely able to do it, then we start sitting there thinking that ourselves and blaming other people. So when Jesus asked that man, he was like, do you want to be healed? You know, the guy was saying, well, you know, everybody always beats me to the water. And so this, he, and that is not what I asked you. He asked him, he says, do you want to be healed? And finally, the man got to his yes. He finally got to the place where he was like yet saying, yes, I want to be healed. And then Jesus told him, he says, well, then pick up your bed and walk. And so, you know, the guy actually gets up and he picks up his bed and he starts to walk. And of course, everybody around him, not seeing what happened, everybody around him says, who do you think you are to get up? You know? What are you doing? And how is it that you pick up your bed and you walk and it's the Sabbath day, you know? And so, of course, there comes another barrier. You can't do it because they can't do it, and so they want to keep you from doing it. It's like that crabs in a barrel mentality. How often do we get stuck in that? 
And so it becomes this thing of, you know, not just are you not willing to get up, but now all of a sudden all your friends are out there and they're telling you not to get up. You know, they're telling you and you can't do it on this day. Last night I was at an event and one of my girlfriends, she just wrote a book. And she has her book published on, um, a, it's a Kindle book. And it, it's so amazing because I'm looking at her like, and, you know, Rhonda Crowder, she used to um, write for the, for the Call and Post. Mm -hmm. And so now she's got her book out. And so, you know, like everybody else, we're, I'm, I'm sitting there because, of course, I went out and I got her book. Well, I just ordered it on my phone. <laughs> Makes it real simple. No excuses, no reasons why you can't. I ordered the book on the phone and I started reading it. And so, of course, you know, like everybody else, I'm sitting up there saying, well, how do you know this stuff? How did you know? How did you know? How did you know? You know? And, and it's so interesting because for me it's a conversation and not just this idea that, you know, you shouldn't have gone there and you shouldn't have done this or you can't do this or you can't do that. A lot of times what we're looking for and what we need is we need one of those, uh, what do they call those, a cheering section, a booster club. It makes us feel so much better when somebody is cheering us on. Well, it's amazing because what it's saying here is, is Jesus was saying, you know what, that couldn't possibly be the case that, you know, um, God stirs up the water or the angel stirs up the water, only one person gets in. That couldn't possibly be the case because God is a God of all people. God reigns on the just as well as the unjust. He's not saving a blessing just for the first person in. He's blessing everybody that's out here. And he's saying to them that if you want to be healed, it's based on your faith, not on who makes it in first. And so in that, he was saying to him, if you, if you desire this for yourself, not just for yourself, but everybody out here, once you have that desire and once you recognize that God is a God that is, is just about all of us, right? Not a God for some, not a God for only those who believe, but God is God, period. You know, so, so once we re recognize the allness and, and the opulence of it, once you recognize all of that, it's as if a healing is your birthright. It's not something that you're aspiring to. It's not something out there, but it is right where you are. So he goes and, you know, after the guy goes back and, and everybody is, is talking about, you know, who are you to be healed on the Sabbath, this, that, and the other. Jesus says to them, because he went and told the, you know, the priest and everybody, Jesus says to him, he was like, does it not rain and feed the, the grass on the Sabbath? He was like, aren't babies born on the Sabbath? Is God only working like Monday through Saturday and not on the Sabbath too? What kind of craziness is this? And so it becomes the way that we conduct our lives to know that the allness is the allness all the time. God is lavishly abundant and giving to you all the time, not just to one of us, but to all of us all the time. And so it becomes a thing where it's not the situations that need to change. It's not all this other stuff. It's us in our own minds that need to change. There is nothing to fear. The same God that allowed Rhonda to write the book allows you to write the book. It allows you to sing your song. It allows you to do what it is that you fear to do. It is saying yes to you. And the fact that you're here on this earth, on this plane at this moment, is all the permission that you need. Amen. Now, so why not? Uh, you know... When I, when I keep thinking, when I go back to Eleanor Roosevelt's quote, you know, that, that whole thing about do something that you fear, I kept thinking to myself, what is it that I fear to do? I got a lot of things that I fear to do if I'm honest about it, right? I mean, a lot of times I, I'm like, you know, people would say, even with the coat, I told you guys the story about my coat. It's like I had a fear of wearing a coat. 
because, you know, who am I? What makes me so special? You know, the ideas and judgments that we have about other people and, you know, the pretentiousness and all this other stuff, it's not true. God gave and God gives to you abundantly. Press down, running over all of that stuff, right? So who are you not to? How many people, it's so funny, how many people wanted to drive a luxury car and then they don't drive the luxury car that they want because they're worried about what other people will think about them, you know? How many people won't, you know, I had a girlfriend that even turned down a position because she was like, oh, you know, I would be promoted out over people who have been here longer than me. <laughs> okay, and that means what? You know, we, I tell you, when I, and, and you know, I can only speak half the time. I, I, I look at all my friends and all that stuff, but I mean, I've got stories in my own life. I mean, when I, when I was in school, I don't know if I told you guys about this before, you know, I'm, I'm in a class. I was, I was really good at math, but of course I hated to admit it because I just didn't want anybody to think that I was special. And so, you know, the teacher puts up a, a problem on the board and she is like the first person that solves this problem gets an A and everybody else is going, ooh, ooh, ooh. And they're guessing and they're throwing out all these numbers. And I'm sitting there and I'm looking at it and I'm like, but this is a fraction. And everybody else is saying stuff and they're just guessing and guessing. So you know what Sandra does. Sandra taps the guy up in front of her and says, say this. <laughs> And so what does he do? He says it. And she's like, you know, it's like the clouds part. Mm. She's like sitting there, so she's so proud of him. And she says, come up and show us how you got that. <laughs> so when he gets up there and he stands at the board, he's just standing there. And he looks back over his shoulder like I'm going to be able to tell him from there, you know. And he kind of keeps looking back like I've let him down. I've, I've betrayed him somehow. So when class is over, I don't know if I told you this, we were all filing out of class and she's standing there at the door. And you know what she said to me as I went by? She pinched me on the arm and she says, you got 10 cents on the ball and don't have sense enough to use it. And she let me go. And I walked around for years wondering what that meant. Ten cents on the ball and don't have sense enough to use it. How often is that us? How often is it me? And so the question becomes, do we have ten cents on the ball and don't have sense enough to use it just because we're scared? Just because we're embarrassed? Just because we don't want to outshine somebody else? In, in Miriam Williamson's book, she says, you know, she says, the thing is, is she says, we throw away our own stuff because we don't want to outshine. She's like, nobody has to come and take your candy. Nobody has to come and take your money. Nobody has to come and do anything to us. We throw it away because, you know, we can't accept the gifts that we're given. You've got stuff that's given just to you. We all have stuff that's given just to us. It's our gift to bless the world with. And how often is it we just give it away because we just don't have it within us to stand up on that truth. Then we look at other people and we just wonder like, you know, the, you know, and, and wonder how it is that they do it, you know? The, the Obamas of the world or the Beyonce's of the world or people who come and they just, you know, drop it. They just put down their talent or do whatever it is that they do without thinking about it because that's who they are. And yet we languish so long by the pool because we think that somebody else was supposed to put us in it. We think that somebody else is supposed to shine the spotlight on us. The spotlight is not over there. The spotlight comes from within to without, right? And so once we know that truth for ourselves, it's our responsibility to turn it on and to let it shine, to let it flow. I love it as, you know, and, 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 and sometimes it's, it's 
the things we sit there and we think like, well, I don't know what it is. Well, ask yourself, what are you scared of? What do you fear? What is it that you feel like you're, like you're holding on to and that you haven't let out? What is that? And sometimes we may think, oh, it's not that big of a deal. Right? Sometimes we think, yeah, you know, I, I, I got a girlfriend who, um, how old is a fee? Maybe about 60, 62 or something like that. You know, she plays the bass guitar now. And she just took lessons a couple of years ago. Now she has cards that say, I play bass. Right? And she hands them out to other people. And when a musician can't show up, she's there taking their place. I mean, now all of a sudden she was a writer, you know, she wrote for the, you know, the plain dealer forever. Then she wrote a book. Now she plays the bass. I mean, it's amazing the things that we can do when we get out of our own way. But so often, mm, we make it about something else, somebody else, other things. But you know what? We would all, I mean, if we knew the capacity that was in us to be, to do, to have, to shine, and when we let our light shine, we give other people the permission to let their light shine, right? I mean, if, if we look at somebody else and says, well, if she can do it, then I can do it. That person isn't so different from me. I, I, I made, um, we, we go to this wine dinner on Tuesday nights. And we, every month, it's once a month, and every month we go to this wine dinner. And it's uh, everybody, you know, we've got all these different personalities. It's an eclectic group. I love the group. And so the other day I wanted to take everybody a Christmas gift. And I was thinking like to myself, well, do I take candy canes? Do I take, uh, you know, do I go out and buy something? You know, what is it that I take? And so I decided what I could do. It was an inexpensive thing to do. I'm going to bake cakes. So I get my stuff together and I whip it all up and I made all these cakes and I put them in these cute boxes. I wrapped them all up. And I'll tell you guys, I don't know. <laughs> you know how it is? You haven't exactly tasted the cake and you <laughs> hadn't baked that cake before and you don't know exactly how it's going to be. And so you're sitting there with all these cakes and they're just like, you're sitting there. <laughs> Am I actually going to give it out? You know, these people are real connoisseurs of food. <laughs> so, of course, you know, at a certain point at the end of the evening, I figured, well, I don't want to take all this stuff back with me. So I started handing out the little cakes and everything. I handed them to everybody, and I said, well, I said, I'd never baked this cake before. Here come my excuses. I've never tried this before. I'm, I just threw something together. We eat it at restaurants. They serve it warm, put a little ice cream on it. It'll be okay, you know. I'm doing my apologies for it. Just like the little, you know, just like me and the little problem on the board and the guy. I'm, of course, making all the excuses because I just knew nobody was going to like my bacon. But then all of a sudden, the next day, here comes my little things coming in on Facebook. Oh, my God, Sandra, that cake was so good. And I'm sitting there, and it's like, whew. I'm telling Alan, whew. You know? I mean, could you imagine? I have, I, I tell you guys, because I, I, you know, I tell all my business anyway. I've done karaoke, and I know what it's like when you mess up, because all of a sudden nobody wants to look at you. <laughs> like, whoo, you know, you got up there and you look like you had a little something, something on you, but you come off the stage and nobody's even... <laughs> They're not even looking your way. You know when you've done bad, right? I mean, I was like, you know. I, so I know what it's like when people, you know, don't like what it is that you do. And then other people will come up to you and they're like, wow. You know, and they're so excited about the gift that you've given. You guys, all of us have something that we do that is our gifting to the world. Are you a great listener? 
Are you one of those people that can, you know, sometimes we see problems going on in everybody else's lives. We have the answers, but we never speak up. Because, you know, who are we to do it? If that's your gifting, give your gift. Figure out what it is and give from that deep place within that is your gift to the world. We made Christmas about so many other things. We made it so materialistic. We got to give gifts and we got to do that. But what about the gift that is you? What about coming fully to the table and giving from your deep self? That's what's called for here. When Jesus was born in the manger, it's so interesting in that whole story, it says three wise men looked up at the stars and they followed the star to the place, to the manger where he was. There was nothing that came out and said that on such and such a day, this person will be born and he'll be wearing such and such so you can identify him clearly. No, they came bearing gifts on a hunch. It was, it was not something. It was like they put two and two together and they followed this and they weren't sure when they went up there. They couldn't have been sure. Mary wasn't sure. Joseph wasn't sure. It was some angel said, and, and even that, when an angel speaks to you, are you sure? It requires faith that takes us over the hump. We can have faith in all kinds of things, but when we don't have it in ourselves, what does it mean? And when we're not using it, what does it mean? Faith is like a, a, a verb. It means that something, you have to do something, you have to stretch somewhere. Something has to occur. And so this thing of, of faith, if we exercise it in, a, in, in, in ourselves, it'll mean that we're actively doing something. What is it that is yours to do? What is the gift that you give? Who is the gift and who is the giver? All of this stuff comes into question right here and right now at this time, right? This year. Let's be about something other than, because you know, these, sometimes this stuff that we go by, it has absolutely no value. But when we give from our deepest self, that's when we're getting into something that has value. That's when we're really tapping in. So if nothing else, you guys, I won't be here next week. I'll be out of town. But I would encourage each and every one of you to do like I'm going to do. And do something that scares you every single day. I think that's a great, great way to go into 2017. Let's start doing something that scares us. And then when we start to do something that scares us, instead of waiting 38 years to, you know, for somebody else to come along and, you know, and do something for us. If we do something that scares us every single day, maybe we'll get closer to who we're truly meant to be. Deal? Yeah. All right. So pray with me. So, Mother, Father, God, we give thanks for this day. We give thanks for this season. We give thanks for one another. We give thanks that our eyes are open to the truth of our being. That, God, we are as you are. That it is within us to be, to do, to have, to be the gift, to be the light. And so, God, as we step into this awareness, this unity with you, we just recognize that we can't go wrong. God, that everything that happens, happens in order for our own good and our own growth. So, God, I thank you that we are divinely guided and divinely led, and that we have the courage to do what it is that is for us to do. We give thanks, God, and we let it go, knowing that it can't return to us void. And so it is. Amen, y'all.